of book Born Gay, the sex researchers Glenn Wilson and Kazi Rahman note that self-identified labels can be influenced by political and cultural climate. For example, many homosexuals throughout history and in some oppressive regimes today have been forced to remain in the closet due to social pressure and threat of legal punishment, including death. Actual sexual behavior, Wilson and Rahman note, can be influenced by opportunities and circumstances. For example, many heterosexual men often have sex with other men while in prison due to the complete absence of potential female sexual partners. In contrast, sexual feelings and physiological measures are more stable and closer to individuals' true sexual orientation. For example, self-identified heterosexual men who are openly and publicly homophobic may nonetheless show genital response of arousal to sexual images of other men. Yes, some of the most openly homophobic men turn out to be secretly homosexual themselves. Remember the ex-Marine neighbor of Kevin Spacey's character in American Beauty? Wilson and Rahman also note that homosexual fantasies are quite common in heterosexual men and women as a form of mental explorations, and that measuring homosexuality with reported sexual fantasies and desires assumes that survey respondents are completely honest about them. All in all, Wilson and Rahman conclude that physiologically measured arousal, genital or brain responses to sexual images of men or women, is probably the most accurate measure of true sexual orientation, and the other three measures may correlate poorly with it and may deviate from their true sexual orientation, especially among women. Given that an individual's true sexual orientation, at least for men, is prenatally determined, either genetically at the moment of conception or through prenatal exposure to androgen during gestation prior to birth, it is not likely that more intelligent individuals are more likely to be truly homosexual. There is a possibility, however, that the as-yet-undiscovered genes for intelligence are somehow linked to the as-yet-undiscovered genes for homosexuality in men, because genes for both intelligence and male homosexuality appear to be located on the chromosome XQ28. At any rate, Given that the first three measures of sexual orientation are more malleable and subject to conscious choice and self-presentation, it may also be possible that more intelligent individuals are more likely to appear homosexual by these measures, that is, if homosexual identity and behavior are evolutionarily novel. Regardless of their true sexual orientation, more intelligent individuals may identify themselves as homosexual, engage in homosexual behavior, or report homosexual fantasies and desires. Evolutionary Novelty of Homosexual Identity and Behavior in order to examine the extent to which our ancestors might have identified themselves as homosexuals and engaged in homosexual behavior, I have once again consulted the same ethnographic records of traditional societies throughout the world that I use in earlier chapters. When it comes to homosexuality, contemporary hunter-gatherers, while not exactly the same as our ancestors, are probably a lot more similar to our ancestors than our residents of San Francisco or Brighton today. The ten-volume compendium, the Encyclopedia of World Cultures, mentions male homosexuality in seven different cultures. Foy, Gabusi, Kaluli, Karaki, Kiwai, Marind Anim, and Sambia. However, these are phylogenetically closely related tribes all in Papua New Guinea, and all practices of male homosexuality in these Papua New Guinean cultures occur strictly as part of initiation rites for boys. For example, Gabusi believe boys must be orally inseminated to obtain male life force and attain adulthood. Insemination continues during adolescence and culminates in the male initiation, wakawala, or child becoming big, between ages 17 and 23. And among the Sambia, male maturation requires homoerotic insemination to attain biological competence. Initiation rituals thus involve complex homosexual contact from late childhood until marriage when it stops. 
These homosexual practices in Papua New Guinea appear highly ritualized and culturally mandated. There appears very little individual choice involved, and as such, homosexuality does not appear to be an individual difference variable where some people practice it while others don't, where some people are homosexual and others are heterosexual. It therefore appears quite different from what we normally mean by sexual relations which involve choice, emotions, and attachment. At any rate, it is very difficult to suggest that homosexuality was a routine part of our ancestors' life if its present-day practice on a large scale among traditional societies is limited only to one island in the South Pacific far outside of the ancestral environment of sub-Saharan Africa. In addition, I have also consulted the five extensive monograph-length ethnographies of traditional societies around the world which I rely upon in earlier chapters. In any of these ethnographies, there is no mention of explicit homosexual relationships among the members of the societies under study. The only potential exception is the Panegi among the Ake. Some men in our sample never had any children and others never acquired a wife. One category of men in Och society opts out of the male mating pool altogether. These men, called Panegi, take on a female socioeconomic role. The world pain means unsuccessful or unlucky at hunting. Men who are Panegi generally do not hunt, but instead collect plant resources and insect larvae. They weave baskets, mats, and fans, and make tooth necklaces, bowstrings, and other female handicrafts. They spend long hours cooking, collecting firewood or water, and caring for children. Most informants stated that Panegis did not ever engage in homosexual behavior, oral or anal, prior to first contact. A few informants said they were not sure, but had never heard of such behavior. Panegis are apparently small in stature, and, at least in North America, homosexual men are shorter than heterosexual men. So perhaps the Panegis among the Och may have been genetically and hormonally predisposed to homosexuality. But the ethnographic records make it clear that they nonetheless engage in homosexual behavior prior to first contact with the Western civilization. It is very important to point out, however, that even very extensive ethnographies based on long-term fieldwork by very experienced anthropologists familiar with the local culture and language may not always detect instances of homosexuality. This may especially be the case if homosexuality is condemned and negatively sanctioned in the local culture. So the absence of references to homosexuality in these ethnographies is not by itself conclusive evidence of its absence in traditional societies. However, the same ethnographers and anthropologists have nonetheless been adept at uncovering evidence of other negatively sanctioned and concealed behavior like murder, theft, infanticide, and extramarital affairs in the same traditional societies. So the near total absence of any documentation of homosexual behavior as an individual choice may suggest that it may be relatively rare in such societies. It may also suggest that widespread practice of homosexual behavior may have been rare in the ancestral environment and it may therefore be evolutionarily novel. If homosexual identity and behavior are evolutionarily novel, then the intelligence paradox would predict that, regardless of their true sexual orientation, more intelligent individuals may be more likely to identify themselves as homosexual, report homosexual feelings and desires, and engage in homosexual behavior than less intelligent individuals. All three main data sets for this book, the GSS, Ad Health and the NCDS allow me to examine the association between intelligence and homosexuality. Intelligence and homosexuality. Ad Health. Ad Health uses two different measures of homosexuality. The first question asks the respondents to identify their sexual orientation as either 1 equals 100% heterosexual, straight. 2 equals mostly heterosexual, straight, but somewhat attracted to people of your own sex. 3 equals bisexual, 
that is, attracted to men and women equally. 4 equals mostly homosexual or gay, but somewhat attracted to people of the opposite sex. And 5 equals 100% homosexual, gay. This measure of sexual orientation corresponds to the self-identified label definition of it in number one above. The analysis of ad health data show that even net of sex, age, race, marital status, parenthood, education, income, and religion, more intelligent children are more likely to identify themselves as homosexual in early adulthood than less intelligent children. The more intelligent ad health respondents are in junior high and high school, the more homosexual they identify themselves to be in their 20s. The effect of childhood intelligence on adult homosexual identity does not differ for men and women. Even though childhood intelligence and education are naturally positively associated, the more intelligent they are in childhood, the greater education they attain by early adulthood, intelligence and education have opposite effects on adult homosexual identity. While more intelligent individuals are more likely to identify themselves to be homosexual, the more educated individuals are less likely to do so. Figure 9.1 represents the bivariate association between childhood intelligence and adult sexual identity. It shows that the association is monotonically positive. Very bright children grow up to become more homosexual in their identity than bright children who in turn grow up to become more homosexual than normal children, etc. The probability that one would observe a pattern as strong as the one depicted in figure 9.1 purely by chance when there is actually no association between childhood intelligence and adult sexual identity is less than one in a hundred billion. The second question asks, have you ever had a romantic attraction to a member of the same sex? The respondents can answer either yes or no. This measure corresponds to the self-reported sexual feelings definition of sexual orientation, three above. The analysis of ad health data shows that net of the same factors as above, more intelligent children are more likely to have experienced adult homosexual attraction than less intelligent children. The more intelligent ad health respondents are in junior high and high school, the more likely they are to have ever experienced romantic attraction to members of the same sex. If you increase childhood intelligence by 15 IQ points, one standard deviation, then you increase the odds of expressed adult homosexual attraction by 27%. The effect of childhood intelligence on adult homosexual attraction is significantly stronger for women than for men. In fact, underscoring their more fluid sexuality, women have more than 50% greater odds of having ever experienced romantic attraction to members of the same sex than men do. Figure 9.2 represents the bivariate association between childhood intelligence and expressed adult homosexual attraction. It shows that the association is monotonically positive. Very bright children are more likely ever to have experienced adult homosexual attraction than bright children who are, in turn, more likely ever to have experienced it than normal children, etc. In fact, very bright children are nearly twice as likely to grow up to experience adult homosexual attraction as very dull children. The probability that one would observe a pattern as strong as the one depicted in figure 9.2 purely by chance when there is actually no association between childhood intelligence and expressed adult homosexual attraction is less than 1 in 10,000. GSS. While ad health has precise measures of homosexual identity and feelings corresponding to 1 and 3 in the list of definitions of sexual orientation above. It unfortunately lacks any measure of actual sexual behavior with members of the same sex. It only measures heterosexual sexual behavior. I therefore now turn to the GSS, which measures both homosexual and heterosexual behavior. The GSS measures the respondent's homosexual and heterosexual behavior by asking how many sex partners of each sex they have ever had since they were 18. 
This measure of sexual orientation corresponds to the actual sexual behavior definition of it, too, in the above list. The analysis of the GSS data that consistent with the intelligence paradox net of sex, age, race, social class, education, income, marital status, number of children, religion, and survey year, more intelligent individuals have more homosexual partners in their adult life than less intelligent individuals. Contrary to the prediction of the intelligence paradox, the GSS data also show that net of the same control variables, more intelligent individuals have more heterosexual partners in their adult life as well than less intelligent individuals. However, the effect of intelligence on the number of homosexual partners is twice as strong as its effect on the number of heterosexual partners. Very bright Americans have had eight times as many homosexual partners as very dull Americans. In sharp contrast, very bright Americans have had less than 40% more heterosexual partners than very dull Americans. In fact, bright Americans have had more heterosexual partners than very bright Americans. NCDS Add health and GSS very precisely measure homosexuality by the three more malleable, less stable definitions of sexual orientation, one, two, and three in the list above, and the data show that all three measures of homosexuality are significantly positively associated with intelligence. And the data show that all three measures of homosexuality are significantly positively associated with intelligence. The more intelligent the individuals, the more homosexual they are. Even net of a large number of potential confounds and correlates of intelligence. However, ad health and GSS have one small problem. As I mentioned in the introduction when I discussed the details of the data sets, both ad health and GSS have measures of verbal intelligence, not general intelligence. While verbal intelligence is very strongly and significantly correlated with general intelligence, in fact, it is an important component of general intelligence, it is not exactly the same as general intelligence. NCDS rectifies this problem as it has a very good and highly reliable measure of general intelligence assessed by 11 cognitive tests administered at three different ages. Unfortunately, the only measure of sexual orientation that NCDS has is the number of sex and cohabitation partners. At age 47, NCDS asks its respondents how many same-sex and opposite-sex cohabitation partners they have had, defined as someone with whom the respondents have lived as married and shared an accommodation for six months or longer. Using this measure of sexual orientation, the analysis of the NCDS data show that more intelligent children before the age of 16 have significantly more lifetime homosexual cohabitation partners 30 years later than less intelligent children, even after statistically controlling for sex, whether currently married, whether ever married, whether ever a parent, education, income, and religion. In sharp contrast, childhood general intelligence is not at all associated with the lifetime number of heterosexual partners. Since heterosexual cohabitation is eminently evolutionarily familiar, this is once again perfectly consistent with the prediction of the intelligence paradox. The analyses of all three data sets, Ad Health, GSS, and NCDS, uniformly confirm the prediction of the intelligence paradox. More intelligent children are more likely to grow up to identify themselves as homosexual and to have ever experienced romantic attraction to members of the same sex. More intelligent individuals have had more lifetime homosexual sex partners than less intelligent individuals, although intelligence is also associated with the lifetime number of heterosexual partners. More intelligent children grow up to have a larger number of lifetime homosexual cohabitation partners 30 years later, but childhood general intelligence does not predict the lifetime number of heterosexual partners.
the positive association between intelligence and homosexuality appears to be quite strong and robust. Chapter 10. Why More Intelligent People Like Classical Music I first became interested in the possible effect of general intelligence on musical tastes when I was visiting my wife's hometown of Novgorod, Russia, in June 2002. Novgorod is an ancient provincial town, not at all cosmopolitan like Moscow or St. Petersburg, and it was years before the current influx of guest workers from the former Soviet republics in Central Asia into Novgorod and other Russian cities. So I was just about the only Asian, the only non-Slav, in the entire town of Novgorod, and I stuck out like a sore thumb everywhere I went. People stared at me because it was obvious to all that I was not a local. The only other time I experienced anything like that in my life was when my car, my trusted 1977 Datsun Cherry F10 hatchback, broke down in Wallace, Idaho during my transcontinental drive in the early fall of 1986. I had to spend several hours in Wallace while my car was being repaired in a local garage. I appeared to be the only non-white person in the entire town of Wallace that day, or quite possibly any day, and everybody looked at me like I was a rock star. A group of teenagers would walk by and wave at me simply because I looked different. Anyway, being in Novgorod was like being in Wallace, Idaho all over again, and I was the only Asian in the whole town. I did not see another non-Slavic face during my entire visit. One night, my wife and I decided to go to a classical music concert held at a local concert hall. It was a very small concert with a small audience and a small orchestra. Yet, there she was, the first violin of the small local orchestra in Novgorod was an Asian woman. She was the only Asian I saw in all of Novgorod during my entire visit. Could this be a coincidence? I don't know anything about classical music, but casual observations seem to suggest that many of the famous classical musicians throughout the world were either Jewish or Asian, the two ethnic groups with the highest average intelligence. It also seemed to me that many of the people who enjoyed listening to classical music, which decidedly does not include me, were typically highly educated and upper class, therefore more intelligent people. Could there possibly be a connection between intelligence and appreciation for classical music? Are more intelligent people more likely to appreciate and therefore perform classical music? If so, why? What's special about classical music? Here's another casual observation. If you like driving across the country in the United States, as I do, and if you are a fan of the National Public Radio, as I am, you may notice a pattern in the character of NPR stations across the country. In big cities like New York or Washington, D.C., NPR stations tend to be news and talk stations and air news and talk programs throughout the day. In small towns, in contrast, NPR stations tend to air news and talk programs like Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Fresh Air, only during the morning and evening driving hours, but otherwise air music throughout the day and night. I assume this is because carefully produced news and talk programs are more expensive to purchase and air than CDs, and NPR stations in large cities have larger budgets that allow them to purchase such programs whereas NPR stations in smaller towns with smaller operating budgets must play music from CDs most of the day. Typically, NPR and other radio stations which play music have themes. No radio stations play a random collection of music. They usually focus on certain genres of music to play. So, there are classic rock stations and there are country western stations. Over the years, I have noticed that NPR stations that are not news and talk stations frequently play classical and jazz music. According to surveys conducted on behalf of the Recording Industry Association of America in 2008, only 1.9% of a representative sample of Americans purchased classical music in all formats in the past month, and 1.1% purchased jazz. The largest number of people, 31.8%, purchased rock music in the past month. 
More than 10 times as many people purchased rock music than classical and jazz combined. In sharp contrast of the 143 NPR stations which provide online streaming as of April 2011, out of a total of 910 NPR stations nationwide, 42.7% 61 play classical music and a further 14% play jazz. Only 30.8% play the combined genres of rock, pop, and folk. Judging by these statistics, classical and jazz listeners are nearly 20 times overrepresented among the NPR station listeners. 3% of the American population versus 56.7% of NPR stations. But why is this? Why do NPR listeners like to listen to classical or jazz music? NPR stations and their listeners are notoriously and overwhelmingly left-wing liberals. And, as I show in Chapter 5, left-wing liberals are on average more intelligent than right-wing conservatives. Does that mean that more intelligent radio listeners are more likely to prefer classical or jazz music? If so, why? In order to answer these questions, I first had to find out how music initially came about in human evolutionary history. What is the evolutionary origin of music? Why are animals musical? Evolutionary Origins of Music In comparison to evolutionary origins and functions of language and art, anthropologists and archaeologists have paid scant attention to the origin of music. In his book, The Singing Neanderthals, The Origins of Music, Language, Mind, and Body, the cognitive archaeologist Stephen Mithen offers a novel theory of the evolution of music. Mithen argues that language and music had a common precursor called musal language, which later developed into two separate systems of music and language. There are two distinct perspectives on the evolution of language. The compositional approach suggests that words came before sentences, a lexicon of words that referred to specific entities like meat, fire, and hunt emerged first, and were later combined into phrases and then into sentences. Grammar emerged at the end to dictate how words could be combined into sentences. In contrast, the holistic approach proposes that sentences came before words. It suggests that the precursor to human language was a communication system composed of messages in the form of arbitrary strings of sounds rather than words. Each individual utterance or sequence of sounds was associated with a specific meaning. These utterances were later broken up into words which could then be recombined to create further utterances. Mithen favors the holistic approach. As evidence, he points to the fact that all non-human primate utterances, such as vervet monkeys' alarm calls, rhythmic chatters of gelatas, duets of pear-bonded gibbons, and pant hoots of chimpanzees, are holistic and indivisible. In other words, non-human primates do not have words. Even though they have languages and their utterances as a whole convey specific meanings and emotions. Some primatologists disagree, however, and point out in support of the compositional approach that Diana and Campbell's monkey calls have both syntactic and semantic rules, which can be used to combine elements, words, to produce further utterances. The debate on the origin of human language between the compositional and holistic approaches is far from closed. Humans and monkeys can communicate with each other. Here's something very interesting. Studies demonstrate that meanings and emotions of primate utterances may be shared by different primate species. For example, when macaquic vocalizations that are made in specific social contexts as expressions of contentment, pleading, dominance, anger, and fear are recorded and then played back, Finnish children and adults are able to interpret accurately what the expressed emotions are. In other words, humans can understand what monkeys mean when they speak. Another study shows that words spoken by Finnish and English speakers in the social contexts of contentment, pleading, dominance, anger, and fear have the same acoustic waveforms as the macaquic vocalizations made in the corresponding contexts. 
it is as though humans and macaques may be able to communicate with each other through the use of holistic utterances and messages. Mithen contends that human proto-language was holistic manipulative. It was designed to induce desired emotions and behavior in other individuals, multimodal. It involved not only vocal utterance, also gesture and dance. Musical, the utterances had distinct pitches, rhythms, and melodies. And mimetic, conscious and intentional. This proto-language eventually evolved into two systems of communication, music to express emotions and language to transmit information. To demonstrate the common evolutionary origin of music and language, Mithen surveyed a large number of clinical cases of individuals with amusia, the absence of musical abilities while retaining some linguistic abilities, and aphasia, the absence of linguistic abilities while retaining some musical abilities. These case studies largely show that music and language are based on discrete modules in the brain. Some of these are separate and dedicated to one or the other, while others are shared. Songs are evolutionarily familiar, but instrumental music is evolutionarily novel. If Mithen is right, if music and language share a common evolutionary origin in holistic musical utterances designed to convey messages, one possible implication is that music, in its evolutionary origin, was songs that individuals sang to express their desires and emotions in an attempt to induce desired emotions and behavior in others. In other words, music, in its evolutionary origin, was always vocal and never purely instrumental. Purely instrumental music, unaccompanied by singing, may therefore be evolutionarily novel. It may be instructive to note in this context that Blackfoot Indians have a word for song, but not for instrumental music. The language of the Puraha in the Amazon forest in Brazil may be an extant example of a Musa language which Mithen envisions as the precursor to the modern language and music. While the Puraha language does have words, it has the fewest number of vowels, three, and consonants, seven for women, eight for men, of all known human languages. The Piraha people communicate almost as much by singing, whistling, and humming as they do using consonants and vowels. Piraha Prasetti is very rich with a well-documented five-way weight distinction between syllable types. The former professional musician and current academic linguist, as well as the originator of the holistic approach to the evolutionary origin of language, Alison Ray notes, To my taste, Western classical music, as indeed most other musical traditions worldwide, is different in kind from musical expressions in evolutionary history. Its production is, for a start, subject to a heavy burden of learning that few master. There is no naturally facilitated access to the comprehension, let alone creation, of the kinds of melodies, harmonies, and rhythms found in the works of Bach or Schoenberg. No equivalent for music of this kind, of first language acquisition. In other words, according to Ray, classical music of Bach, Schoenberg, and others is evolutionarily novel, partly, I contend, because it is largely or entirely instrumental. Consistent with Ray's assertion, a far greater proportion of the general population can, and spontaneously do, sing songs than play musical instruments. For example, the incidence of tone deafness in the United Kingdom is estimated to be about 4 to 5 percent. In other words, 95 percent of the population can sing adequately, and some of the tone deaf people nonetheless often do sing. The proportion of the general population who play musical instruments adequately is nowhere near as high. Further, in many cases of playing musical instruments, such as the guitar or the piano, it is often accompanied by singing. In the context of the intelligence paradox, then, Mithen's theory of the evolutionary origins of music suggests that more intelligent individuals are more likely to appreciate purely instrumental music than less intelligent individuals because such music is evolutionarily novel. In contrast, general intelligence has no effect on the appreciation of vocal music. 
From this perspective, more intelligent people may appreciate classical music more because it is largely or entirely instrumental, and more intelligent people should prefer other types of instrumental music as well. Intelligence and Tastes for Music Two large nationally representative data sets have asked questions about the respondents' musical tastes. One is the GSS, which I explain in the introduction. The other is the 1986 follow-up to the British Cohort Study, BCS. The BCS is very similar to the NCDS. In fact, it was modeled after the NCDS. Just like the NCDS, the original sample of the BCS includes all babies born in Great Britain during one week in April 1970, and they have been followed periodically ever since. In 1986, when the respondents were 16, the BCS asked them a series of questions about what kinds of music they listened to. In 1993, the GSS asked about the respondents' taste for 18 different kinds of music. Big band, bluegrass, country western, blues or R&B, Broadway musicals, classical, folk, gospel, jazz, Latin, easy listening, new age, opera, rap, reggae, contemporary rock, oldie, and heavy metal. Even though it's different to classify entire genres of music as either entirely vocal or entirely instrumental, I nevertheless classify big band, classical, and easy listening, elevator music, as largely instrumental and the rest as largely vocal. Jazz is a difficult case, as much of jazz is also purely instrumental. However, an earlier study found that more intelligent individuals prefer to listen to jazz, so classifying it as largely vocal rather than largely instrumental constitutes a conservative classification, which would make it more difficult for me to find evidence for the prediction that more intelligent people are more likely to prefer instrumental music. When it comes to statistical analysis, it is always good to be conservative rather than liberal. I believe the fact that so many established musical genres are vocal and so few are instrumental is in itself evidence that music in its evolutionary origin might have been vocal. The 1986 follow-up to the BCS asked about the respondent's taste for 12 different kinds of music. Classical light music, folk music, disco, reggae, soul, heavy rock, funk, electronic, punk, other pop music, and other, I classify classical and light music, easy listening or elevator music, as largely instrumental and the rest as largely vocal. In addition, the 1986 follow-up to the BCS who asked the teenagers' TV viewing habits by asking whether they watched 22 different types of TV shows. Two of these 22 types refer to music, pop rock music and classical music. I therefore examine the effect of intelligence on watching TV programs on different genres of music. Despite the fact that these surveys were conducted in different decades in different countries, they both support the prediction derived from the intelligence paradox. In the U.S., net of age, race, sex, education, family income, religion, whether currently married, whether ever married, and number of children, more intelligent individuals are more likely to prefer largely instrumental music, big band, classical, and easy listening, than less intelligent individuals. In contrast, intelligence is not associated with the GSS respondent's preference for largely vocal music. Intelligence is also significantly associated with the difference in preference between instrumental and vocal music. The mathematical difference obtained by subtracting their average preference for vocal music from their average preference for instrumental music. The more intelligent the GSS respondents are, the greater their difference in preference between the two types of music. The results are exactly the same for the 1986 BCS sample in the United Kingdom. Net of academic performance, all BCS respondents are still in school, sex, race, religion, family income, mother's education, and father's education, more intelligent British teenagers are more likely to prefer instrumental music, classical and light music, than their less intelligent classmates. In contrast, their intelligence is not associated with their preference for vocal music.
As a result, their intelligence is also significantly associated with the difference in preference between instrumental and vocal music. The more intelligent the BCS respondents are, the greater the difference in preference between the two types of music. Net of the same potential confounds, more intelligent BCS respondents are more likely to watch TV shows about classical music than their less intelligent classmates. Despite the fact that more intelligent people enjoy watching TV less in general than less intelligent people. In sharp contrast, more intelligent BCS respondents are less likely to watch TV shows about pop rock music. As a result, intelligence is very strongly associated with the difference in the viewing frequency of TV shows about the two types of music. For illustrative purposes, here is the association between intelligence and preference for classical music among the GSS respondents. The GSS respondents who like classical music very much have the average IQ of 106.5. In contrast, those who dislike classical music very much, like myself, have the average IQ of 93.3. People who like classical music very much are more intelligent than those who dislike it very much by more than 13 IQ points. As you can see, the association between intelligence and preference for classical music is monotonic. The more they like classical music, the more intelligent they are. The probability that one would observe a pattern as strong as the one depicted in Figure 10.2 purely by chance when there is actually no association between verbal intelligence and preference for classical music is less than 1 in 100 quadrillion or 100,000 trillion or 100 million billion or 10 to the 17th power. And here is the association between intelligence and whether they usually listen to classical music among the BCS respondents. British teenagers who usually listen to classical music are much more intelligent than their classmates who usually don't listen to classical music by more than seven IQ points. The probability that one would observe a pattern as strong as the one depicted in figure 10.3 purely by chance when there is actually no association between verbal intelligence and preference for classical music is less than 1 in 10 non-million. That's 1 followed by 31 zeros or 10 to the 31st power. In other words, it's less likely than impossible. Evolutionary Novelty or Cognitive Complexity the analyses of two separate large nationally representative data sets with one sample of teenagers in the United Kingdom and another of adults in the United States suggest that more intelligent individuals are more likely to prefer evolutionarily novel instrumental music than less intelligent individuals. While intelligence does not affect individuals' preference for evolutionarily familiar vocal music. One potential objection to this conclusion is that the dimension of evolutionary novelty captured by the distinction between instrumental and vocal music is confounded with cognitive complexity of music, which is defined by chordal complexity, the number of chords, tones, and instruments used in the music and their interrelationships. For example, Classical music, which is largely instrumental, is also cognitively complex. It is probably the most cognitively complex form of music in human history. On the other extreme, rap music, which is almost entirely vocal, often to the exclusion of any discernible melodic structure, is also cognitively very simple. So critics may argue that the association between intelligence and preference for instrumental music may really be an association between intelligence and cognitively complex forms of music. In order properly to examine and rule out this alternative hypothesis, I would ideally need a quantitative cognitive complexity score for each genre of music in the form classical equals 5, jazz equals 4.5, etc. Further, such cognitive complexity scores would ideally have been validated and widely in use. I searched the literature extensively and consulted several different experts in music perception, but have not been able to locate such cognitive complexity scores for different musical genres. They simply do not seem to exist. 
Yet, most people seem to understand and agree intuitively that, for example, classical music and jazz are far more cognitively complex than, say, rap music. In the absence of quantitative and validated cognitive complexity scores, I must rely on such intuitive but widely shared senses of cognitive complexity of musical genres. A potential problem with inspecting the association between intelligence and preference for each specific musical genre is that preferences for all musical genres are very highly correlated. It appears that there are people who like music, and there are those like me who don't, and those who like music like types of music. For example, in the GSS data, preference for classical music is positively and significantly correlated with preference for both bluegrass and reggae music. In fact, it is significantly positively associated with 12 out of the 17 other genres of music. People who like classical music like to listen to most genres of music. In Chapter 3, I explain the statistical technique called factor analysis. This is the technique psychometricians use to extract a common underlying factor, general intelligence, that explains individuals' performance on all types of cognitive tests. Factor analysis can be used with any set of scores to extract what's common among them. If you submit GSS respondents' preference for 18 different genres of music, factor analysis extracts only one underlying dimension. It means that one dimension, general preference for music, explains individuals' preference for all types of music, just as one dimension, general intelligence, explains individuals' performance on all types of cognitive tests. So, I examine the association between intelligence and preference for each genre of music while holding constant preferences for all other types of music. The result shows that, as expected, preference for classical music is significantly positively associated with intelligence, net of preferences for all other types of music. However, preference for big band is even more strongly positively associated with intelligence than is preference for classical music. It would be difficult to make the case that big band music is more cognitively complex than classical music. At the other extreme, as suspected, preference for rap music is significantly negatively associated with intelligence. However, preference for gospel music is even more strongly negatively associated with intelligence. It would be difficult to make the case that gospel is less cognitively complex than rap. I might also point out, in passing, that with its close link to religious rituals, gospel is a particularly evolutionarily familiar form of music. At the same time, preference for opera, another highly cognitively complex form of music, is not significantly correlated with intelligence. Its non-significantly positive association is smaller than those for oldies, reggae, and Broadway musicals. It would be difficult to make the case that oldies, reggae, and Broadway musicals are cognitively more complex than opera. These conclusions remain when I further control for the GSS respondents' age, race, sex, education, family income, religion, whether currently married, whether ever married, and number of children. When these additional controls are included in the statistical analysis, the positive association between preference for classical music and intelligence is no longer statistically significant. While the association between preference for big band and intelligence remains statistically significantly positive, with the additional controls, the association between preference for oldies and intelligence is statistically significantly positive. It would be difficult to make the case that oldies and big band are cognitively more complex than classical music. Other researchers have classified blues, jazz, classical, and folk music as structurally complex. But when preferences of all musical genres are controlled, preferences for none of these structurally complex genres are significantly correlated with intelligence. Preferences for folk and jazz are non-significantly negatively associated with intelligence. All in all, the analysis provides very little support for the view that more intelligent individuals necessarily and uniformly prefer cognitively complex genres of music. 
The intelligence paradox applied to musical genres might therefore explain, among other things, why Jews and East Asians are more likely to excel as classical musicians and why most NPR stations throughout the country play classical and jazz music as their station themes. Purely instrumental music may be evolutionarily novel and therefore unnatural, and more intelligent individuals may have a preference for such unnatural genres of music. Chapter 11. Why Intelligent People Drink and Smoke More Recall from the introduction that one of my major goals in this book is to break the equation of intelligence with human worth and to demolish the myth that intelligence is universally good and that more intelligent people are universally better at everything than less intelligent people. For this purpose, an interesting test case involves the consumption of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, because it is widely agreed that their consumption, especially their excessive use, has largely negative health consequences. If I can demonstrate that more intelligent individuals are more likely to consume these substances to excess, then I would have gone a long way toward demonstrating that more intelligent people don't always do the right thing, and in fact, more intelligent people are often more likely to do stupid things. In this chapter, I'm therefore going to discuss drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, and using illegal drugs. While, once again, science does not make any value judgment, it would be very difficult to make the case from any perspective other than strictly scientific that these activities are neither good nor bad. We know the health hazards of drinking, smoking, and taking drugs. Although the current consensus of medical researchers appears to be that drinking alcohol in moderation may have some health benefits. You will see below that that's not what I'm talking about. I will be talking about getting drunk and binge drinking, which have no discernible health benefits. So, unlike all the preferences and values I have discussed so far in this book, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, and taking drugs, especially to excess, are all inherently bad for health. But the intelligence paradox is not about good or bad healthy or unhealthy values and preferences. All that matters is their evolutionary novelty. No matter how bad they may be, the intelligence paradox would nevertheless predict that more intelligent individuals are more likely to value and prefer them if they are evolutionarily novel. So the question is, are they? Brief histories of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Alcohol. The human consumption of alcohol probably originated from frugivory, consumption of fruits, fermentation of if they are evolutionarily novel. So the question is, are they? Brief histories of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Alcohol. The human consumption of alcohol probably originated from frugivory, consumption of fruits, fermentation of sugars by yeast, naturally present in overripe and decaying fruits, produces ethanol, known to intoxicate birds and mammals that consume them. However, the amount of ethanol alcohol present in such fruits ranges from trace to 5%, roughly comparable to light beer, 0 to 4%. It is nothing compared to the amount of alcohol present in regular beer, 4 to 6%, wine, 12 to 15 percent, and distilled spirits, 20 to 95 percent. Ingestion of alcohol, however, was unintentional or haphazard for humans until some 10,000 years ago, and intentional fermentation of fruits and grain to yield ethanol arose only recently within human history. The production of beer, which relies on a large amount of grain, and that of wine, which similarly requires a large amount of grapes, could not have taken place before the advent of agriculture around 8000 BC. Archaeological evidence dates the production of beer and wine to Mesopotamia at about 6000 BC. The origin of distilled spirits is far more recent and is traced either to the Middle East or China at about 700 AD. The word alcohol, alcohol, is Arabic in origin. 
Relative to the geographical duration of the hominid lineage, therefore, exposure of humans to concentration of ethanol higher than those attained by fermentation alone, in other words, at most 5%, is strikingly recent. Further, any unintentional or haphazard consumption of alcohol in the ancestral environment via the consumption of overripe and decaying fruits happened as a result of eating, not drinking, whereas alcohol is almost entirely consumed today via drinking. So there appears very little doubt that drinking alcohol of any measurable concentration is evolutionarily novel. Tobacco the human consumption of tobacco is more recent in origin than that of alcohol. The tobacco plant originated in South America and spread to the rest of the world. Native Americans began cultivating two species of the tobacco plant, Nicotiana rustica and Nicotiana tobacum, about 8,000 years ago. The consumption of tobacco was unknown outside of the Americas until Columbus brought it back to Europe at the end of the 15th century. The consumption of tobacco is therefore of very recent historical origin and is definitely evolutionarily novel. Drugs Most psychoactive drugs have even more recent historical origin than alcohol and tobacco. Before the rise of agriculture, access to psychoactive substances likely was limited. The use of opium dates back to about 5,000 years ago, and the earliest reference to the pharmacological use of cannabis is in a book written in 2737 BC by the Chinese Emperor Shen Nung. Most other psychoactive drugs commonly in use today require modern chemical procedures to manufacture and are therefore of much more recent origin. Morphine was isolated from opium in 1806. Heroin was discovered in 1874. Cocaine was first manufactured in 1860. It is therefore safe to conclude that most psychoactive drugs in use today are evolutionarily novel and very recent in historical origin. Given that the consumption of alcohol, tobacco, and psychoactive drugs is all evolutionarily novel, unknown before the end of the Pleistocene epoch 10,000 years ago, the intelligence paradox would predict that, perhaps contrary to common sense and the unquestioned assumption that intelligent people make smart choices in life, more intelligent individuals are more likely to consume all such substances than less intelligent individuals. Both NCDS and Ad Health allow me to examine the effect of childhood intelligence on adult substance use. Intelligence and Substance Use Alcohol NCDS asks its respondents about the frequency and quantity of their alcohol consumption. First, it asks its respondents how often they usually have an alcoholic drink at ages 23, 33, and 42. I use factor analysis to compute the NCDS respondents' latent tendency to consume alcohol frequently in their adult life. Latent factors produced by factor analysis have the mean of zero and standard deviation of one. The NCDS asks its respondents about the quantity of their consumption of different alcoholic beverages such as beer, spirits, wine, martini, sherry, and alcopops. That's British for flavored alcoholic drinks like wine coolers. NCDS asks these questions at ages 23, 33, and 42. Once again, I use factor analysis to compute the NCDS respondent's latent tendency to consume a large quantity of various alcoholic beverages. The analysis of the NCDS data shows that net of sex, religion, religiosity, whether currently married, whether ever married, number of children, education, income, whether depressed, satisfaction with life, parents' social class, mother's education, and father's education, more intelligent children are more likely to grow up to consume more alcohol in their adult life, measured both by frequency and quantity, because such a large number of potential confounds are statistically controlled for, it is not likely, albeit technically possible, that the association between childhood general intelligence and adult alcohol consumption can be attributed to another factor. For example, 
It's not likely that it is because more intelligent people are more likely to have certain occupations, such as executive or managerial positions that require socialization or negotiation over drinks, that childhood general intelligence and adult alcohol consumption are positively associated. Because both education and income, as well as social class at birth, mother's education and father's education are controlled for. Interestingly, of these factors, only income and father's education independently increase the respondent's adult alcohol consumption, both by frequency and quantity. Educational class at birth and mother's education have no effect on adult alcohol consumption. Ad Health asks four questions about their alcohol consumption. How much they drink, how often they drink, how often they engage in binge drinking, five or more drinks in one sitting, and how often they get drunk. Once again, using factor analysis, I compute ad health respondents' latent tendency to consume alcohol. The analysis of the ad health data shows that net of age, sex, race, hispanicity, religion, marital status, parenthood, education, income, political attitude, liberal versus conservative, religiosity, general satisfaction with life, whether they are taking medication for stress, whether they feel stress but do not take medication for it, frequency of socialization with friends, number of sex partners in the last 12 months, childhood family income, mother's education, and father's education. In other words, lots of potentially confounding factors. Childhood intelligence significantly increases adult alcohol consumption. The more intelligent they are in junior high and high school, the more alcohol they consume in early adulthood. Once again, given the even larger number of statistical controls in the analysis of the ad health data than in the analysis of the NCDS data, it is very unlikely that the apparent effect of childhood intelligence can be attributed to something else. Neither income nor education is significantly associated with adult alcohol consumption. As with NCDS, father's education, but not mother's education, increases ad health respondents' adult alcohol consumption. The more intelligent NCDS respondents are in childhood, the more they consume alcohol in adulthood. Very bright individuals and very dull individuals are separated by nearly a full standard deviation. They are separated by four-fifths of a standard deviation. These effects are very large. More intelligent people are more likely to binge drink and get drunk. There are occasional medical reports and scientific studies which tout the health benefits of mild alcohol consumption, such as drinking a glass of red wine with dinner every night. So it may be tempting to conclude that more intelligent individuals are more likely to engage in such mild alcohol consumption than less intelligent individuals, and the positive association between childhood general intelligence and adult alcohol consumption reflects such mild and thus healthy and beneficial alcohol consumption. Unfortunately for the intelligent individuals, this is not the case. More intelligent children are more likely to grow up to engage in binge drinking, consuming five or more units of alcohol in one sitting, and getting drunk. Ad Health asks its respondents specific questions about binge drinking and getting drunk. For binge drinking, Ad Health asks, during the past 12 months, on how many days did you drink five or more drinks in a row? For getting drunk, it asks, during the past 12 months, on how many days have you been drunk or very high on alcohol? For both questions, the respondents can answer on a six-point ordinal scale. Zero equals none. One equals one or two days in the past 12 months. Two equals once a month or less, three to 12 times in the past 12 months. Three equals two or three days a month. 4 equals 1 or 2 days a week, 5 equals 3 or 5 days a week, 6 equals every day or almost every day. There is a clear monotonic positive association between childhood intelligence and adult frequency of binge drinking. Very dull 
add health respondents with childhood IQ less than 75 engage in binge drinking less than once a year. In sharp contrast, very bright add health respondents with childhood IQ greater than 125 engage in binge drinking roughly once every other month. The association between childhood intelligence and adult frequency of getting drunk is equally clear and monotonic. Very dull, ad health respondents almost never get drunk. Whereas very bright, ad health respondents get drunk once every other month or so, just as frequently as they engage in binge drinking, which makes sense since binge drinking almost necessarily and by definition would make most people drunk. In a multiple ordinal regression, childhood intelligence has a significantly positive effect on adult frequency of both binge drinking and of getting drunk. Controlling for age, sex, race, ethnicity, religion, marital status, parental status, education, earnings, political attitudes, religiosity, general satisfaction with life, taking medication for stress, experience of stress without taking medication, frequency of socialization with friends, number of sex partners in the last 12 months, childhood family income, mother's education, and father's education. I honestly cannot think of any other variable that might be correlated with childhood intelligence than those already controlled for in the multiple regression analyses. It means that the effect of childhood intelligence is not confounded with any of the variables already included in the equations. It is very likely that childhood intelligence itself, not anything else that may be confounded with it, increases the adult frequency of binge drinking and getting drunk. Note that education is controlled for in the ordinal multiple regression analysis. Given that ad health respondents in wave 3, when their drinking behavior is measured, are in their early 20s, it may be tempting to conclude that the association between childhood intelligence and adult frequency of binge drinking and getting drunk may be mediated by college attendance. More intelligent children are more likely to go to college, and college students are more likely to engage in binge drinking and to get drunk. The significant partial effect of childhood intelligence on the adult frequency of binge drinking and getting drunk, net of education, shows that this indeed is not the case. Childhood intelligence itself, not education, increases the adult frequency of binge drinking and getting drunk. In fact, in both equations, education does not have a significant effect on binge drinking and getting drunk. Net of all the other variables included in the ordinal multiple regression equations, education is not significantly associated with the frequency of binge drinking and getting drunk. It means that college students are more likely to engage in binge drinking not because they're in college, but because they are more intelligent. Tobacco. NCDS measures its respondents' tobacco consumption by asking how many cigarettes a day they usually smoke at ages 23, 33, 42, and 47. I compute their latent tendency toward tobacco consumption by performing factor analysis. To my surprise, and contrary to the prediction of the intelligence paradox, the analysis of the NCDS data shows that net of the same control variables as above in the analysis of alcohol consumption, more intelligent British children are less likely to grow up to consume tobacco in their adult life. Ad Health measures its respondents' tobacco consumption by asking on how many days they have smoked cigarettes in the last 30 days and how many cigarettes a day they smoked in the last 30 days. I compute their latent tendency toward tobacco consumption by performing factor analysis. In sharp contrast to NCDS and consistent with the prediction of the intelligence paradox, Ad Health data confirm the prediction. Net of the same control variables as before in the analysis of alcohol consumption, more intelligent children grow up to consume more tobacco in their early adulthood. Why does intelligence affect smoking differently in the U.S. and the U.K.? I'm not sure what accounts for the divergent results from NCDS and Ad Health when it comes to the effect of childhood intelligence on adult smoking. However, mine is not the only study which shows such varied results. 
Other studies have also shown that more intelligent Brits are less likely to smoke, while more intelligent Americans are more likely to smoke. In my study, the two data sets are different in two major respects. First, NCDS is conducted in the United Kingdom, while Ad Health is conducted in the United States. Second, NCDS respondents were born in March 1958, while Ad Health respondents were born between 1974 and 1983. Further research is necessary to determine whether it is the cultural differences between the two, otherwise very similar, nations, or the generational differences between the NCDS and Ad Health cohorts that produce the strikingly divergent results when it comes to the effect of childhood intelligence on adult tobacco consumption. Among the possible differences between the U.S. and the U.K., the public anti-smoking campaign has been far more aggressive and blatant in the U.K. than in the U.S. For example, in the U.S., each pack of cigarettes carries the Surgeon General's relatively tame and clinical warning, smoking causes lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and may complicate pregnancy, in small print on the side of the package. In the UK, the warnings are much more blatant and graphic. Smoking kills. Smokers die younger. Smoking may reduce the blood flow and causes impotence. Smoking can cause slow and painful death. Smoking clogs the arteries and causes heart attacks and strokes. Smoking when pregnant harms your baby. In extremely large print on the front of the package. Note that the death is never mentioned explicitly in the Surgeon General's warning in the U.S., but is frequently mentioned in the U.K. warnings. And they mention something much worse than death from an evolutionary perspective. Impotence for men and harm to the baby for women, and thereby implied lack of reproductive success. When I saw the warning smoking kills for the first time in 2003 on a pack of cigarettes that my LSE colleague was smoking, I thought it was a joke. It looked like a gag item that one might buy at a novelty store in a shopping mall like Spencer's or Hot Topic. I didn't realize that it was for real until after I saw other packs of cigarettes with similar warnings later. Because government warnings and public campaigns, as well as the written language as their medium of communication, are themselves evolutionarily novel, more intelligent individuals may be more likely to respond to such warnings than do less intelligent individuals. This is just one of the possible reasons why intelligence may have such starkly opposite effects on smoking in the U.S. and the U.K., to be honest, I don't find this a particularly convincing answer myself. I feel relatively certain that the national difference in the effect of general intelligence on smoking is robust and real, not a methodological artifact. Because different studies using different data sets and methodologies all confirm it. But I don't like my own explanation for it. I feel there is a better explanation out there. I just don't know what it is. Drugs. At age 42 only, NCDS asks its respondents whether they have ever tried 13 different types of illegal psychoactive drugs. Cannabis, ecstasy, amphetamines, LSD, amyl nitrate, magic mushrooms, cocaine, temzepan, semarin, ketamine, crack, heroin, and methadone. Via factor analysis, I compute NCDS respondents' latent tendency to consume illegal drugs. The statistical analysis of the NCDS data shows that net of the same control variables as before, more intelligent children are more likely to grow up to consume more illegal drugs than less intelligent children. The higher their general intelligence before the age of 16, the more illegal drugs that they try before the age of 42. Just as with alcohol consumption, there is a monotonic positive association between childhood general intelligence and adult consumption of illegal drugs. But the effect of childhood general intelligence on adult consumption of illegal drugs is not as large as its effect on adult alcohol consumption. Very bright and very dull NCDS respondents are separated only by about one-third of a standard deviation. Ad Health asks its respondents about their consumption of five different illegal drugs, marijuana, cocaine, LSD, crystal meth, and heroin. 
Via factor analysis, I once again compute Ad Health respondents' latent tendency to consume illegal drugs. The statistical analysis of the Ad Health data shows that the effect of childhood intelligence on adult consumption of illegal drugs, while positive as predicted by the intelligence paradox, is not statistically significant. So Ad Health data do not provide unambiguous support for the prediction of the intelligence paradox with regard to illegal drugs, as do the NCDS data. Intelligence Finality Criminologists have long known that criminals on average have lower intelligence than the general population. Juvenile delinquents are less intelligent than non-delinquents. And a significant difference in IQ between delinquents and non-delinquents appears as early as ages 8 and 9. Chronic offenders are less intelligent than one-time offenders. And serious offenders are less intelligent than less serious offenders. The negative association between general intelligence and criminality is not an artifact of a selection bias, whereby less intelligent criminals are more likely to be caught than more intelligent criminals who get away because the association exists even in self-report studies that do not rely on official police statistics. Yes, people often do reveal in interviews and surveys that they have committed crimes that they are not charged with, even those that the police don't know about. Why is this? Why do criminals have lower intelligence than the general population? And why do more chronic and serious criminals have lower intelligence than their less chronic and serious counterparts? From the perspective of the intelligence paradox, there are two important points to note. First, much of what we now call interpersonal crime today, such as murder, assault, robbery, and theft, were probably routine means of competition among men for resources and mates. This is how men likely competed for resources and mating opportunities for much of human evolutionary history. We may infer this from the fact that behaviors that would be classified as criminal if engaged in by humans are common among other species, including other primates such as chimpanzees, bonobos, and capuchin monkeys. Second, the institutions and technologies that control, detect, and punish criminal behavior in society today, the police, the courts, the prisons, CCTV cameras, DNA fingerprinting, are all evolutionarily novel. There was very little formal third-party enforcement of norms in the ancestral environment. Only second-party enforcement, retaliation by victims and their kin and allies, or informal third-party enforcement, ostracism, one need only recall Van Beest and Williams' findings in their cyberball experiment discussed in Chapter 2 to realize how powerful a punishment ostracism must have been in the ancestral environment. It therefore makes sense from the perspective of the intelligence paradox that men with low general intelligence may be more likely to resort to evolutionarily familiar means of competition for resources, theft rather than full-time employment, and mating opportunities, rape rather than computer dating, because they are less likely to recognize and comprehend the more evolutionarily novel means, as well as often lacking access to them. It also makes sense that such men do not fully comprehend the consequences of criminal behavior imposed by evolutionarily novel technologies and institutions of law enforcement. Why do less intelligent people commit some crimes but not others? But if less intelligent individuals are more likely to commit crimes, why are they less likely to use illegal drugs? The consumption of psychoactive drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, and heroin is illegal in both the UK and the US. In other words, it is a crime to use such substances. So why aren't less intelligent individuals more likely to commit the crime of drug use? This is the proverbial case of the exception which proves the rule. As I mentioned above, less intelligent individuals are more likely to engage in crime not because it is criminal per se, but because most of it is evolutionarily familiar. Less intelligent individuals are less likely to engage in behavior that is evolutionarily novel, whether it is defined by the civilized society as criminal or not. 
This is why less intelligent individuals are less likely to consume evolutionarily novel substances of psychoactive drugs even though it is criminal. Less intelligent individuals are probably less likely to engage in other evolutionarily novel forms of criminal behavior such as check forgery, insider trading, and embezzlement even apart from the fact that more intelligent individuals are probably more likely to have the opportunity to commit such crimes. That is true for insider trading and embezzlement, but probably not check forgery. Less intelligent individuals are simultaneously less likely to consume the legal substance of alcohol and the illegal substances of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. At the same time, they are more likely to commit the crimes of murder, rape, and theft but not the crime of drug consumption. These two observations suggest that what matters is not legality or criminality per se, but evolutionary novelty. Less intelligent individuals are more likely to commit crimes, but only when they are evolutionarily familiar. Unlike the implications of the intelligence paradox discussed in chapters 5 through 10, the empirical support for the implication of the intelligence paradox with regard to alcohol, tobacco, and illegal drugs is somewhat equivocal. Both NCDS and Ad Health data provide strong empirical support for the intelligence paradox with regard to alcohol consumption. Both in the UK and in the US, more intelligent children grow up to consume more alcohol than less intelligent children. In addition, more intelligent American children grow up to binge drink and get drunk more frequently in their early adulthood. The empirical support is split when it comes to tobacco consumption. More intelligent children grow up to consume less tobacco in adulthood in the UK, while the opposite is the case in the US. Only the ad health data provides support for the prediction of the intelligence paradox with regard to tobacco consumption. Finally, NCDS data provides strong empirical support for the implication of the intelligence paradox with regard to illegal drugs, while ad health data don't. More research is necessary to figure out what is behind the divergent results for tobacco and illegal drugs in the UK and in the US. Chapter 12. Why Intelligent People Are the Ultimate Losers in Life Reproduction is the Ultimate Goal of All Living Organisms If any value is deeply evolutionarily familiar, it is reproductive success. If any value is truly unnatural, if there is one thing that humans and all other species in nature are decisively mined for, it is voluntary childlessness. All living organisms in nature, including humans, are evolutionarily designed to reproduce. Reproductive success is the ultimate end of all biological existence. While having children is not the only means to achieve reproductive success, representation of one's genes in the next generation, as it could also be achieved by investment in close genetic relatives, it is nonetheless the primary means of maximizing reproductive success. None of us are descended from ancestors who remained childless, and we are disproportionately descended from individuals who achieved disproportionate reproductive success. So, voluntary childlessness is not part of evolved human nature, just as exclusive homosexuality is not part of evolved human nature. In Chapter 9, I address the question of why some people identify themselves as homosexual and engage in homosexual behavior despite the fact that human nature is largely heterosexual. In this chapter, I address the question of why some individuals choose to remain childless or have fewer children than they can safely raise to sexual maturity despite the fact that reproductive success is the ultimate meaning of life. Having children, and having as many children as one can potentially raise to sexual maturity so that the children themselves can reproduce, is an evolutionarily familiar goal. In contrast, voluntary childlessness or having far fewer children than one can reasonably raise to sexual maturity is evolutionarily novel. 
The intelligence paradox would therefore predict that more intelligent individuals are more likely to have fewer children or to remain childless than less intelligent individuals. Intelligence and the Value for Children At age 23, near the beginning of the reproductive careers of most British people, NCDS asked its respondents how many children they wanted to have in their lives. More intelligent NCDS respondents wanted significantly fewer children than their less intelligent counterparts. Childhood general intelligence has a significantly negative effect on how many children they want, for both men and women. The more intelligent they are in childhood, the fewer children they want in adulthood. Women who do not want to have any children at all in their lives have significantly higher childhood IQ than those who want at least one child. Those who want no children have a mean childhood IQ of 105.5, whereas those who want some children have a mean childhood IQ of 99.9. .9. The picture is identical among men. Those who do not want to have any children at all have a mean childhood IQ of 104.3, whereas those who want some children have a mean childhood IQ of 100.0. The differences between the two categories of NCDS respondents are highly statistically significant among both women and men. However, once I control for whether currently married, whether ever married, religiosity, religion, income, education, social class at birth, mother's education, father's education, and number of siblings, childhood IQ has a significantly negative effect on the desired number of children only among men, not among women. Among men, childhood general intelligence still has a significantly negative effect on the desired number of children at age 23. No other variables have any significant effect on the number of desired children for men. Among women, the number of siblings has a significantly positive effect on the desired number of children. The more siblings the women have themselves, the more children they want to have. But childhood general intelligence no longer has a significant association with the desired number of children once all the social and demographic factors are statistically controlled. However, even net of the same social and demographic factors, childhood general intelligence has a significantly negative effect on the desired parenthood, whether they want to become parents or remain childless, both among men and women. More intelligent men and women are significantly more likely to want to remain childless than less intelligent men and women. So it appears that general intelligence makes a difference only in the decision to become parents or not for both sexes. Less intelligent individuals are significantly more likely to want to become parents, and more intelligent individuals are significantly more likely to want to remain voluntarily childless. But beyond that, only less intelligent men, but not less intelligent women, want to have more children than their more intelligent counterparts. Childhood general intelligence significantly predicts the value for parenthood for both men and women, but the value for children only for men. Intelligence and the Number of Children According to one study of the Swedish population, 99.7% of women and 96.5% of men complete their lifetime reproduction by the time they are 45. In other words, very few people, women or men, have children after they are 45. By sweep 7 in 2004-2005, the NCDS respondents were 46 to 47 years old, so I can safely assume that most of them have completed their reproductive careers by sweep 7. I will therefore look at how many children they have actually had before sweep 7. By the time they are 47, childhood general intelligence has a significantly negative effect on the number of children NCDS respondents have had only among women, not among men. More intelligent women have had fewer children than less intelligent women, but more intelligent men have not had fewer children than less intelligent men. Recall that in bivariate analysis, both more intelligent men and more intelligent women wanted to have fewer children when they were 23. 
It therefore means that more intelligent women have been able to fulfill their desire to have fewer children a quarter of a century later at the end of their reproductive careers. But more intelligent men have not been able to fulfill their similar desire to have fewer children. Even net of the same social and demographic characteristics as before, in the analysis of the desired number of children above, more intelligent women have fewer children in their lifetimes than less intelligent women. In contrast, more intelligent men, despite having wanted to have children at age 23, do not actually have fewer children by age 47. Among women, childhood general intelligence significantly decreases the number of children they have had in their lifetimes. Among men, it does not. While the effect of childhood general intelligence on women's fertility is consistent with the prediction of the intelligence paradox, the lack of the same effect among men is inconsistent with it. More intelligent women are significantly more likely to remain childless and significantly less likely to become parents than less intelligent women. The mean childhood IQ of women who have remained childless for life is 105.3, whereas the mean childhood IQ of women who have become parents is 101.7. The difference in mean childhood IQ between the two categories of women is very large and statistically significant. In contrast, more intelligent men are no more likely to remain childless for life than less intelligent men. The mean childhood IQ of men who have remained childless is 102.2, while the mean childhood IQ of men who have become parents is 103. The difference is not statistically significant. Men who remain childless and men who have become parents have essentially the same mean childhood IQ. This is once again contrary to the prediction of the intelligence paradox. Why women, not men? It is not clear to me why more intelligent men who wanted fewer children than less intelligent men at the start of their reproductive careers do not actually have fewer children. This is in sharp contrast to more intelligent women who wanted fewer children and in fact do have fewer children than less intelligent women. The data, however, allow me to rule out some possible explanations. Some might suspect that more intelligent women have fewer children than less intelligent women because more intelligent women are more likely to pursue higher education or more demanding careers and in doing so must sacrifice and forego motherhood. In this view, women often have to make a difficult decision between family and careers, as the latter often demands pursuit of graduate education and investment in careers during the prime reproductive years for women. As a result, women cannot often pursue both family and careers and must choose between them. In contrast, men do not have to make such a decision. They can still pursue higher education or demanding careers and at the same time manage to have family and children. However, the data analysis shows that this is decidedly not the reason we observe the sex difference in the effect of childhood general intelligence on lifetime fertility among the NCDS respondents. It is not why more intelligent women have fewer children while more intelligent men don't. How do we know? We know this because neither education nor income has any effect on the number of children women have. If the alternative explanation above is correct, then more educated women and women with greater earnings, which usually accompany demanding careers, should have fewer children than women with less education and earnings. But this is not the case. Only childhood intelligence, not educational achievement or earnings, decreases the number of children women have. Contrary to popular belief, more educated women and women with more demanding careers do not have fewer children and are not more likely to remain childless. Another possibility is that women find intelligent men more attractive as mates. The evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey F. Miller has consistently argued that women preferentially select men with higher levels of intelligence to mate with. 
Given that, as I discuss in Chapter 7, mating among mammalian species is largely a female choice, women's preference for intelligent men as mates can potentially explain why more intelligent men may end up with just as many children as less intelligent men, despite their desire to have fewer children and to remain childless. There appears to be some evidence for this suggestion. Net of the same control variables as above, more intelligent men are significantly more likely to have ever been married and to be currently married at age 47 than less intelligent men. One standard deviation, 15 IQ points, increase in childhood IQ increases men's odds of having ever been married by 23% and the odds of being currently married by 27%. In contrast, more intelligent women are no more likely to have ever been married, although they are more likely to be currently married. It is important to point out, however, that whether they have ever been married and whether they are currently married are always controlled in all the multiple regression analyses summarized above. So, more intelligent men's greater tendency to have ever been married and to be currently married is not the only reason for the absence of the effect of intelligence on men's fertility and parenthood. At any rate, the divergent effect of childhood intelligence on completed fertility for men and women, where more intelligent women have fewer children than less intelligent women, but more intelligent men do not have fewer children than less intelligent men, means, among other things, that modern British people are not very endogamous on intelligence. More intelligent men do not appear to marry more intelligent women in the contemporary United Kingdom. If they are strongly endogamous on intelligence, then the fact that more intelligent women have fewer children will necessarily mean that more intelligent men also have fewer children. This is not the case, and the only reason is that more intelligent men are not married to more intelligent women, and vice versa. Heritability of Fertility, an Evolutionary Puzzle Among both men and women, number of siblings significantly increases the number of children. Since the number of siblings plus one is the same as the number of children that their parents had, this means that fertility, the total number of children individuals have, is highly heritable. The more children your parents have had, and hence the more siblings you have, the more children you have yourself. While this is consistent with earlier studies, heritability of fertility, where the number of children the parents had is positively associated with the number of children the children have, is a mystery from an evolutionary psychological perspective. The evolutionary psychological logic suggests that the association should be negative, not positive. As I mentioned in chapter, there are two principal means for you to increase your reproductive success. You can have and raise your own children, or you can invest in close genetic relatives, such as your full siblings, who share half of your genes. But the option of maximizing reproductive success by investing in siblings is available only to those who have a large number of siblings. If you do not have any siblings, this option is not available to you. So, you must have more children yourself if you do not have many siblings. In contrast, if you do have a large number of siblings, then you don't necessarily have to have many children yourself, because you can increase your reproductive success by investing in your siblings. It is important to remember that you share just as many genes with your full siblings as you do with your own biological children. Both share half of your genes. Genetically speaking, it is slightly more advantageous to invest in your own children than in your full siblings, because your children belong in the next generation, not in the current generation with you and your siblings, and your children are expected to outlive your younger siblings. Nevertheless, it is possible to increase your reproductive success by investing in your siblings. In Chapter 3, I discuss a fundamental principle of quantitative genetics, that there is an inverse relationship between the heritability of a trait and its adaptiveness. The more adaptive a trait, the less heritable it is. Fertility, the desire for and tendency to have children, is very adaptive. 
In fact, it's the very definition of reproductive success. So fertility should not be heritable at all. And all humans should be designed to have the maximum number of children that they can safely raise to sexual maturity, regardless of how many siblings they have. If the number of siblings does affect fertility at all, then for reasons I state above, evolutionary logic suggests that people who have more siblings should have fewer children and instead invest in their siblings. And people who have fewer siblings should have more children. So the number of siblings and the number of children should be negatively correlated. Yet, all the evidence suggests that this is not the case. Fertility appears to be heritable, and people who have more siblings have more children themselves. This remains an evolutionary puzzle. Possible Societal Consequences the analysis of the NCDS data suggests that more intelligent women are more likely to remain childless for life and to have fewer children than less intelligent women. If this finding is robust, and is true not only in the United Kingdom but in other Western societies as well, what would it mean for these societies? What are the likely consequences of more intelligent women being more likely to remain childless and having fewer children than less intelligent women? As I explain in Chapter 3, general intelligence is known to be highly heritable. Genes determine about 80% of the variance in adult intelligence. On average, more intelligent parents beget more intelligent children and the genes that influence general intelligence are thought to be located on the X chromosomes. In fact, as I mentioned in Chapter 9, they are thought to be located in the same region of the X chromosomes as the genes for male homosexuality, XQ28, which may or may not explain why homosexuals are more intelligent. It means that boys inherit their general intelligence from their mothers only, while girls inherit their general intelligence from both their mothers and their fathers. Their fathers, in turn, inherit their general intelligence from their mothers, the girls' paternal grandmothers only. So women influence the general intelligence of future generations very strongly, through their sons and through their paternal granddaughters. If more intelligent women have fewer children and are more likely to remain childless, then one potential consequence is that the average level of general intelligence in society may decline over time. Throughout the 20th century, the average level of general intelligence in most Western industrial nations steadily increased. This phenomenon is now widely known as the Flynn Effect. After two comprehensive reviews of secular increases in average IQ in many Western industrialized nations conducted by James R. Flynn. However, Richard Lin documented the secular rise in intelligence in Japan a few years before Flynn did. For this reason, some scientists prefer the name the Lin-Flynn effect, and I adopt the practice here. The first documentation of the secular rise in IQ may date even further back to the 1930s. Although there is no consensus on what caused the Lin-Flynn effect, one likely factor identified by Richard Lynn himself is the increasing levels of infant and child nutrition and health. Regardless of their genetic endowment, healthier and better nourished babies on average grow up to have higher intelligence later in life than ill and malnourished babies. These factors likely more than compensated for the dysgenic fertility where less intelligent parents have more children throughout the 20th century and the average level of intelligence has increased in most advanced industrial nations with the improved level of infant health and nutrition. The improved health and nutrition as potential causes of the Lin-Flynn effect, however, would predict that the secular increase in general intelligence would halt in advanced industrial nations. The optimal level of health and nutrition has long passed, and now obesity and diabetes have become serious problems in such nations. We are no longer getting healthier and better nourished. We are simply getting fatter in the United States and in other industrial nations. 
If improved health and nutrition are chiefly responsible for the secular increase in general intelligence throughout the 20th century, and if these factors no longer contribute to the increase, then the negative effect of the dysgenic fertility should lead to a declining level of average intelligence in advanced industrial nations. This is in fact happening already. There is strong evidence to suggest that the Lynn Flynn effect was only a 20th century phenomenon. It appears to have ended at the end of the 20th century in the most advanced industrial nations, with simultaneously the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. Studies suggest that the average level of intelligence has begun to decline at the beginning of the 21st century in advanced industrial nations as Australia, Denmark, Norway, and the United Kingdom. Chapter 13 Other Possible Consequences of Intelligence in previous chapters, I explain why more intelligent individuals are more likely to be liberals and atheists, why more intelligent men, but not women, are more likely to value sexual exclusivity, even though they may actually be more likely to have extramarital affairs, why night owls are more intelligent than morning larks, why homosexuals are more intelligent than heterosexuals, why more intelligent individuals prefer to listen to purely instrumental music, such as classical music, why more intelligent individuals drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and use illegal drugs more, and why more intelligent women, but not men, have fewer children and are more likely to remain childless. All of these preferences, values, and lifestyles have one thing in common. They are all evolutionarily novel. So what other preferences and values are evolutionarily novel? What else do more intelligent people like? What else can the intelligence paradox potentially explain? Coffee. In Chapter 11, I discuss the effect of general intelligence on the consumption of alcohol, tobacco, and illegal drugs. More intelligent people are more likely to consume these substances because they are evolutionarily novel. The human consumption of coffee is even more recent in origin than that of alcohol or tobacco. It is traced to Ethiopia in the 9th century. The intelligence paradox would therefore predict that more intelligent individuals will consume more coffee than less intelligent individuals. Among ad health respondents in Wave 1, those who usually have coffee or tea for breakfast on weekday mornings have a significantly, albeit very slightly, higher intelligence than those who don't, 99.5 versus 98.5. Net of age, sex, race, and religion, however, the effect of childhood intelligence on the consumption of coffee or tea is no longer statistically significant. Vegetarianism Another evolutionarily novel value is vegetarianism. Humans are naturally omnivorous and anyone who eschewed animal protein and ate only vegetables in the ancestral environment in the face of food scarcity and precariousness of its supply was not likely to have survived long enough and stayed healthy enough to have left many offspring. So, such a person is not likely to have become our ancestor. Anyone who preferentially ate animal protein and fat in the ancestral environment would have been much more likely to live longer and stay healthier. They are therefore much more likely to have become our ancestors. Vegetarianism would therefore be an evolutionarily novel value, as well as a luxury of abundance. The intelligence paradox would predict that more intelligent individuals are more likely to choose to become a vegetarian than less intelligent individuals. This indeed appears to be the case. Among the NCDS sample, those who are vegetarian at age 42 have significantly higher childhood general intelligence than those who are not vegetarian. Vegetarians have the mean childhood IQ of 109.1, whereas meat eaters have the mean childhood IQ of 100.9. The difference is large and highly statistically significant. The association between childhood general intelligence and adult vegetarianism holds among both women and men separately. 
Among women, vegetarians have a mean childhood IQ of 108, while meat eaters have the mean childhood IQ of 100.7. Among men, vegetarians have the mean childhood IQ of 111, and meat eaters have the mean childhood IQ of 101.1, a 10-point difference. The fact that the difference in childhood IQ between vegetarians and meat eaters is larger among men than among women makes sense in light of the historical division of labor between the sexes. Throughout evolutionary history, men have traditionally hunted animals for their meat, while women have traditionally gathered plant food. So, vegetarianism, a complete and total eschewal of animal meat, should be even more evolutionarily novel for men than for women. Women are 60% more likely to be vegetarians than men are. 3.33% versus 2.07%. Childhood general intelligence has a significantly positive effect on the likelihood of vegetarianism at age 42, even net of a large number of social and demographic factors such as sex, whether ever married, whether currently married, education, income, religion, religiosity, social class at birth, mother's education, and father's education both in the full sample and among men and women separately. There appears very little doubt that more intelligent children are more likely to grow up to be vegetarian as adults in the United Kingdom. One standard deviation, 15 points, increase in childhood IQ increases the odds of adult vegetarianism by 37% among women and by 48% among men. Interestingly, the strong association between childhood intelligence and adult vegetarianism is not replicated with ad health data in the U.S. American vegetarians in early adulthood do have significantly higher childhood intelligence in junior high and high school, but the difference is not large, 101.5 versus 99.3, and it is only significant among women. 101.4 versus 98.5, not among men, 101.7 versus 100.1. This is very strange, given the historical division of labor by sex that I note above. The significant effect of childhood intelligence on adult vegetarianism among Americans disappears entirely once mother's or father's education or religion is statistically controlled. It is not at all clear to me why the difference in childhood intelligence between vegetarians and meat-eaters is so much larger and stronger in the UK than in the US. As I note in Chapter 11, when I discuss the divergent effects of childhood intelligence on the adult consumption of tobacco, two principal differences between NCDS and Ad Health, the national differences between the UK and the US, and the generational differences between those born in March 1958 and those born between 1974 and 1983. I'm not sure if it is the national differences or the generational differences or something entirely different that account for the observed differences in the association between childhood intelligence and adult vegetarianism in the UK and the US. Crime and Punishment as I note above in Chapter 11, the fact that criminals on average are less intelligent than non-criminals is consistent with the intelligence paradox. Much of what we call interpersonal crime today was probably a routine means of intrasexual male competition in the ancestral environment. So, in this sense, crime is natural. In contrast, the technologies and institutions of law enforcement and criminal punishment are evolutionarily novel. So in this sense, the police and the courts are unnatural. It therefore makes sense from the perspective of the intelligence paradox that less intelligent men are more likely to resort to the natural means of criminal behavior to achieve their goals, but they do not fully comprehend the unnatural entities of the criminal justice system. 
Further, as I also explain in Chapter 11, what matters is not the criminality of the behavior per se, but its evolutionary novelty. Less intelligent individuals are more likely to engage in evolutionarily familiar behavior and less likely to engage in evolutionarily novel behavior. This is why less intelligent individuals are less likely to consume illegal drugs because such consumption, while criminal, is evolutionarily novel. The intelligence paradox would also suggest a novel hypothesis with regard to intelligence and criminality. As I mention in Chapter 11, while third-party enforcement, the police and the criminal justice system, is evolutionarily novel, second-party enforcement, retaliation and vigilance by the victims and their kin and allies, is not. So the intelligence paradox would predict that the difference in intelligence between criminals and non-criminals will disappear in situations where third-party enforcement of norms is weak or absent. And criminal behavior is largely controlled via second-party enforcement, such as situations of prolonged anarchy and statelessness. In fact, any situation that resembles the ancestral environment, if I'm right about this, it ironically means that less intelligent men will commit fewer crimes if the police disappeared, although more intelligent men may then commit more crimes. This may also explain why white-collar corporate crimes of the types perpetrated by Enron and WorldCom, which are overwhelmingly committed by men of higher intelligence, abounded in the absence of the police under financial deregulation. Representative Democracy when Congressman Jack Murtha, Democrat of Pennsylvania, unexpectedly died in office in February 2010, one of the names brought up and briefly considered as a possible successor was his wife, Joyce. This is very common. When Senator Ted Kennedy, a Democrat of Massachusetts, died in 2009, his wife, Vicki, was seriously considered as a possible interim successor. And when Congressman Sonny Bono, a Republican of California, died in office in 1998, his widow Mary did succeed him in office. She still represents her late husband's old district to this day, though now married to another congressman from Florida, Connie Mack IV. All of this happened despite the fact that none of the widows had any political experience at the time of their husband's deaths. Sometimes political power is passed on to other family members. When my former congressman Bud Schuster, a Republican of Pennsylvania, resigned in 2001 after a lengthy ethics investigation and a mild congressional sanction, he was succeeded in office by his son Bill, who still represents the 9th District of Pennsylvania to this day. His father's ethics problems apparently have not hampered his own success in politics. And it turns out that the transmission of a congressional seat from father to son has a long history in the United States. A Time Magazine article from 1929 entitled The Congress, Fathers and Sons begins with the following somewhat disturbing paragraph. Primogenitor and hereditary public office have no place in U.S. tradition. This fact, however, did not last week deter the voters of the 7th Minnesota District from electing by a two-to-one majority Paul John Cavalli of Benson to the congressional seat for six years occupied by his father, the Reverend Old John Cavalli, whose charred body was last month found in his burned summer cottage. Sometimes the son does not wait for the father to pass the torch to him. According to the Senate's own records, there has only been one father and son pair in history who served in the Senate simultaneously. Henry Dodge of Wisconsin from 1848 to 1857 and his son Augustus Dodge of Iowa from 1855 to 1858. Interestingly, there have been no father and son who served in the House of Representatives simultaneously, but there has been a mother and son pair. Frances Bolton and her son, Oliver Bolton, both of Ohio, who served simultaneously 1953 to 1957 and 1963 to 1965. And it is not limited to the U.S. Congress. We have elected family members as presidents of the United States. The Adamses, the Harrisons, the Roosevelts, the Bushes, and almost the Kennedys and the Clintons.
In Argentina, the popular president, Nestor Kirchner, chose not to seek nearly certain re-election for a second consecutive term and stepped aside in 2007 so that his wife, Cristina, could run and win the presidency. And she did. Argentinians voted overwhelmingly for her, and she won by a wide margin. The United States is one of the oldest and most well-established representative democracies in the world. It is also probably the only major world power which has never had any history of hereditary monarchy. In fact, the nation was founded with the very goal of rejecting the rule of hereditary monarchy. Why then, now that we have firmly established a secure form of representative democracy in the last two centuries, do we act as if we want hereditary by electing wives, sons, and other family members of politicians to succeed? Now, I'm sure that just like any other profession or career, being a good politician requires certain skills and personality traits, and these skills and personality traits may very well be heritable. Remember Turkheimer's first law of behavior genetics? All human traits are heritable. And the 50-0-50 rule, which I discuss in Chapter 3, suggests that many of these important traits may be 50% heritable. So it makes sense that sons and other genetic relatives, but not wives, of former politicians want to pursue political careers and turn out to be good politicians themselves. Wives of politicians may also turn out to be good politicians themselves if there is a sortative mating where like marries like on the important personality traits for politicians. But that's not what I'm talking about. My question is, why do the people want the wives, sons, and other relatives of former politicians to succeed in office and vote for them as if we have hereditary monarchy and politics ought to be family business? Family business is ubiquitous. Everywhere in the world, sons and daughters inherit and continue their parents' occupations and professions. But politics in representative democracy is different because the continuation of family business requires popular support and consent. The son of the hardware store owner or the plastic surgeon does not require anyone's consent or support to continue his family business. The son of the congressman does. There exist family political dynasties in other democracies as well. For example, from 2005 to 2007, Lech Kaczynski was president of Poland while his twin brother Jaroslaw was prime minister. If it turns out that people everywhere tend to want family members to succeed in political office, then such desire may very well be part of universal human nature. Does that mean that humans everywhere naturally want hereditary monarchy, but with popular support? Is there something in our human nature that would want our political leaders to be succeeded by their wives, sons, and other family members? People sometimes complain that the wives and the sons who inherit their political offices from their family members are not qualified to be elected. Such complaints were particularly strong for George W. Bush and Mary Bono. But this is precisely the point. When a king dies, nobody asks the question, but is the crown prince ready and qualified to succeed to the throne? Instead, he automatically, unquestioningly, and immediately succeeds to his father's throne and becomes the next king, regardless of whether he is qualified or ready. Nobody complains that the legitimate son of a king is not qualified to succeed to the throne because his bloodline is his qualification. That's how hereditary monarchy works. My point is that we are acting like we are electing hereditary monarchs. Despite all the complaints about their utter lack of qualification, George W. Bush was re-elected for the second term, a feat his father did not achieve and Mary Bono continues to be re-elected today. The fact that they and others may not be qualified for their office therefore supports my speculation. If the desire for hereditary monarchy, political succession within the family is part of human nature and universal among all humans, then it means that such a desire is evolutionarily familiar, and the desire for representative democracy or any other form of government 
is evolutionarily novel. Our ancestors during most of human evolutionary history were undoubtedly more egalitarian and democratic than we were in the recent historical past during the late agrarian and early industrial periods. However, all the accoutrements of modern representative democracy, such as the secret ballot, one person, one vote, universal suffrage, and proportional representation are all evolutionarily novel. The intelligence paradox would therefore suggest that more intelligent individuals and populations have greater desire and capacity for representative democracy than less intelligent individuals and populations. Indeed, this appears to be the case. In his comprehensive study of 170 nations in the world, the Finnish political scientist Tatu Vanahainen showed that the average intelligence in society increases its degrees of democracy. The more intelligent the population on average, the more democratic their government. Vanahainen's finding suggests that representative democracy may indeed be evolutionarily novel and unnatural for humans. It does not necessarily mean that humans naturally prefer authoritarian government. The only major alternative form of government in the world today to representative democracy. After all, authoritarian government is also evolutionarily novel. My suggestion is merely that it may be natural for the human mind to expect their new political leader to be a blood relative of the old political leader, and that pure representative democracy, where political successors are not related to their predecessors, may therefore be unnatural. However, recall from Chapter 1 the dangers of naturalistic fallacy. Natural does not mean good or desirable and unnatural does not mean bad or undesirable. It simply means that humans did not evolve to practice representative democracy. Conclusion Intelligent people are not what you think. By now, I hope you have a very different view of intelligence and intelligent people than before you started reading this book. Yes, intelligent people have more education and do better in school because formal education and universities, as well as many subjects taught in schools and universities, are entirely evolutionarily novel. Although they may not be equally evolutionarily novel, psychology, the study of human character and behavior, and home economics, the management of a household, are probably less evolutionarily novel than, say, trigonometry or particle physics. But studying any academic subject in school by listening to lectures, reading books, and taking written exams is evolutionarily novel. In fact, probably all subjects taught in school are more or less evolutionarily novel, which is why we need to teach how to do them. We don't need to teach the students how to make friends, because it is part of human nature, and everybody knows how to make friends on their own. Everybody, that is, except for intelligent people. Yes, intelligent people make more money and attain higher status in organizations because capitalist economy and complex organizations in which most people work today are entirely evolutionarily novel. Yes, intelligent people make better physicians, better astronauts, better scientists, and better violinists because all of these pursuits are evolutionarily novel. But these are all the unimportant things in life. We are not designed to be physicians, astronauts, scientists, or violinists. And intelligent people fail, or at least are no more successful than less intelligent people, in the most important things in life. They do not make better friends. They do not make better spouses and partners. And they do not make better parents precisely because these are things that our ancestors have done for hundreds of thousands of years on the African savanna. Intelligent people, especially intelligent women, make the worst kind of parents, simply because they are least likely to be parents, and intelligent people lack common sense and have stupid ideas. Think about it. If you had a choice, would you rather be a good brain surgeon or a good parent? Would you rather be a good corporate executive or a good friend?
I hope it is apparent by now that intelligence is just one of many, many traits that humans possess and on which there are individual differences like height, weight, hair color, eye color, and many personality traits like aggressiveness and sociability. Just as intelligent people are different from less intelligent people, in both good and bad ways in most people's minds, taller people are different from shorter people and sociable people are different from unsociable people. But we never equate any of these individual traits with human worth. We never believe that taller people or sociable people are inherently more worthy or better human beings than others who don't share their traits. Yes, taller and better looking people make more money, but this is at least in part because they are on average more intelligent. That is why we don't get upset when there are observable group differences in these traits. Nobody gets upset that men are on average taller than women and Caucasians are on average taller than Asians. Yet, for some unfathomable reason, people treat intelligence differently. They believe, or at least act as though they believe, that intelligence is the ultimate gauge of human worth. They believe, or at least act publicly, as though they believe that everybody is, or should be, equally intelligent, because everybody is equally worthy as human beings. They get upset at scientific findings, by now incontrovertible and indisputable, that show there are observable race and sex differences in intelligence. They a priori condemn such findings as racist or sexist. Once again, as Kurtzban aptly applies, it's only good science if the message is politically correct. But they are no more racist than the finding that Caucasians are taller than Asians or blacks have higher blood pressure than whites. They are no more sexist than the finding that men are taller than women. Why should intelligence be any different? Intelligent people are not at all what you think. Intelligent people are more likely to be liberal and atheistic. Why is it inherently better to be liberal and atheistic than to be conservative and religious? Intelligent people are more likely to be night owls than morning larks. Why is it inherently better to get up later in the morning or in the afternoon than earlier? Intelligent people are more likely to be homosexual. Why is it inherently better to be homosexual than heterosexual? Intelligent people prefer to listen to purely instrumental music than vocal music. Why is it inherently better to listen to classical music than folk music? And more intelligent people are more likely to drink alcohol, to smoke tobacco, and to use illegal drugs. Intelligent people are more likely to binge drink and get drunk. Although this, too, is a value judgment which science does not make, it seems very difficult to argue from any perspective that it is better to binge drink, get drunk, smoke cigarettes, and do drugs. Strictly from the health perspective, it is decidedly not good to drink alcohol, especially to excess, smoke tobacco, and use drugs. And intelligent people, especially intelligent women, have fewer children and are more likely to remain childless for life than less intelligent people. Once again, whether or not to have children is a matter of personal choice, at least in Western liberal societies. And it is neither better nor worse to have children than not to have children. Strictly from the perspective of your genes, however, not having children or having fewer children than you can safely raise to sexual maturity is the worst thing you can possibly do in your life. You are failing at the most important task in life, the one thing, the most important thing that you are evolutionarily designed to do. More than exclusive homosexuality or listening to classical music, voluntary childlessness is the most unnatural thing that any living organism can do, including humans. Reproductive success is the ultimate goal of all living organisms, including all humans. That is what all humans are evolutionarily designed to do. It is the meaning of life itself. Voluntary childlessness is therefore the greatest crime against nature, which is why intelligent people do it. Why is the tendency to commit the greatest crime against nature 
the ultimate gauge of human worth. This has been an Audible Inc. production of The Intelligence Paradox, Why the Intelligent Choice Isn't Always the Smart One, written by Satoshi Konosawa, narrated by Paul Neil Rohr. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright, 2012 by Satoshi Konosawa. Production copyright, 2012 by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.